Hey everyone, Josh Borowski here. Um, man, I I got 10 million other things I should be doing right now, but I, I had to do this video. I, I realize sometimes it's better to take imperfect action than, than no action at all uh, because it's not gonna be perfect or the way you want it. Um, what spurred me to make this video is uh, I just found out yesterday, by the way, today is March 26th. So yesterday was March 25th. The Minnesota DNR on their uh, on their website just posted uh, that they're basically doing a survey looking for feedback from people about uh, musky fishing and the long range musky plan. So I, I was like, man, I got to I, I got to do this now. And, um, and I will be honest with you. I, I, I wanted to like have this all done a long time ago. Um, by the way, I'm going to reference a couple videos. I will put the links to them in the, the description and the comments or whatever of this video so that you, you have access to them if you haven't seen them, but I have already done a video of what happened to the Lake Mille Lacs muskies and what happened to the Lake Vermilion muskies. And I was hoping to follow that up with a series of other videos of what happened to the muskies and some of the other bodies of water. And I, you know, kind of like out of time here, right? Like the, this, this is the time to get the information to you. So I'm kind of jamming all this into one video and it's going to be pretty condensed. I'm going to go through it pretty quick because I do not have um, all the charts and graphs uh, that I had available to me for those other two versions. But I, I do want to emphasize that I could. Like if I had more time, I could make them. Like the data exists uh, to do it. And I will share a little bit of that with you. So um, so I'm going to kind of like sum several of the other bodies of water in into this. But I would definitely encourage you to watch those other two videos if you haven't already seen them and aren't familiar. So I'm gonna jump into talking about uh, what happened to Lake Minnetonka, which is another you know big 14,000 plus acre body of water in the musky population there. Um, and I'm gonna keep this pretty brief. Basically, it's a very similar story, okay? There's a, a common thread here. If you if you look at the what happened to Lake Vermilion muskies and what happened to the, to, uh, the Lake Mille Lacs muskies videos, um, I, I, I went through a lot of information showing you, uh, the stocking and I showed all you this, you know, on charts and graphs and everything else, but I just have the data right here for everyone to see. This is, uh, you know, from 1984 to 2020, um, broken down in six year increments, kind of how many musky fingerlings went into Lake Minnetonka on each of those six year increments. And then I kind of average, you know, did an average of this is that's on average how many were going in every other year. Um, one thing I did want to add about this though is uh, just to make everything apples to apples, I used uh, and these are accepted at least for now conversion rates that the DNR is using um, because some of these stocking years they may have stocked yearlings instead of fingerlings, and so the DNR's conversion rate, you know, based on survivability of a of a yearling is basically like a yearling is kind of the equivalent of three fingerlings and an adult muskie is the equivalent um, of four fingerlings. But I, I think you could argue actually, I think there's a fair amount of, of research that's getting gathered that the survival rates are even higher than that. So um, it'd be even more than like a three X or a four X. Sorry, my phone's chirping here, but I promised myself I was gonna make this a one take video. So I'm gonna keep rolling. Um, so anyway, you know, you can kind of see how it's all over the map there, but there's definitely a, a sweet spot. Um, and, and the sweetest spot is actually somewhat masked because I tried to do this in very linear six year, you know, uh, increments, the, the way I have the stocking up on here. But if you look at the highlighted at the bottom down here in yellow, the, 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 the best six year uh, span was from 1998 to 2003. Lake Minnetonka got the equivalent of 22,372 fish. That was th that six year span of stocking was kind of what, what made all the great fishing that, that happened after that. Right. Um, and if you go back and watch the other videos, you'll kind of see there's, there's a cycle. Those fish get put in, they have to grow up and then we catch them. Um, you know, in the other videos, I have charts like this. This is, this is stolen 
from the Vermilion video uh, because I, I didn't have time and I just wanted to get this out. Uh, but basically, you know, if, if I had more time, I could put all of the, uh, like on the left-hand side, this is a Lake Vermilion graph of all the muskie catches in the Muskie's Inc. lunge log, uh, you know, year by year. So you can see where it like went way, way, way up. And then you can see where the big crash happened, right? And then on the right, uh, my buddy Nolan, who unfortunately is not available, he's camping somewhere in the middle of nowhere right now when all this is happening. So kind of just doing this on my own to get it out. But but Nolan uh, is really good with spreadsheets and whatnot. And he um, basically took some, I think, fairly accepted uh, formulas for musky survivability based on, you know, biology and, and stuff that we found in print that was out there of like, this is, you know, generally how long uh, fingerling stocked lives, you know, from this year to this year to this year or whatever. And, and, and so this chart on the right was kind of like showing how, um, different age classes of fish, right? What, like how many of them were alive in the system? Um, we could do the same thing with Lake Minnetonka and you're just going to have to trust me that it, you know, it, it's the same story, right? This is a broken record thing. It's just like, here they are. Here's us catching them. You know, once they've, you, here's you putting them in, here's us catching them after you put them in and then you put in less and now we catch way less after, right? That that's basically the story. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of make that clear. And th that's really, so that's what happened to Lake Minnetonka. The same thing happened to Lake Minnetonka that happened to Lake Vermilion and Mille Lacs. The stocking was drastically decreased. And so the population drastically decreased eventually as well. Um, I also want to talk to you though, this does not get talked a lot about. And I think a lot of people don't realize like what happened with all of our tiger our hybrid uh, musky tiger fisheries in Minnesota. So I want to give you a really quick spiel on that too, because it matters. So uh, we've had quite a few metro water stocked with tigers over the years. We actually at one point had 29 bodies of water that were stocked with tigers. Uh, Bidet, uh, Makaska, and Cedar, and Minnetonka, and White Bear, they all got transitioned over to pure strains. So that uh, and then there was another lake called Taft Lake that got phased out early in 1986 and Lake O'Dowd was only stocked like once. So it doesn't really count, but that, that basically left us with 23 tiger waters in the Metro that we had to fish for like quite a, you know, quite a long time. Um, and, and, and most of them, by the way, were like very good, um, very good big tigers and numbers of tigers came out of almost all of them. Uh, and, and again, if I had more time, I wanted to do a video and get Paul Hartman um, involved because he used to fish tigers a lot back in the day. And there's a, there's a couple uh twin brothers that I know, the Tahitl brothers, they're known as the tiger twins. And they have like an insane photo album, all these giant tigers they caught out of all these lakes back then. Um, so, but basically those 23 lakes kind of broke down like this. There was basically 12 tiger lakes in the East Metro and 11 lakes in the West Metro. Uh, but here's, here's the deal. We have lost 15 of those 23 lakes that I was talking about. They're, they're done. They're like, they, they're no longer stocked with muskies. And most of them, there's no longer muskies in them because tiger muskies do not reproduce. They also do not live nearly as long um as a pure strain muskie does uh they do grow like significantly faster though um but anyway so i want to put this lay li this list of lakes up for you because basically i know there are still people out like fishing these lakes trying to catch muskies and some of them depending on how many years now it's been since they discontinued stocking that maybe you know some of them it's possible there's still some you know, swimming around uh, some, some like the last year class or something of fish. But a lot of these are just completely, there's, they're just not, there's no, there's no tigers left in there at all. So if you're fishing these lakes for muskies, you're wasting your time. Okay. Once upon a time, they were all great, but 15 bodies of water, you guys, that we, that we're just, that we had, that we don't have anymore. They're just gone. Okay. So in some of the ones that we lost were like Cedar Lake and Scott County. That lake was historically one of the best tiger fisheries, at least on paper, on data that we have uh, 
collected in the Muskie's Inc. Lunge Log, you can look at just the year 2006, just in that year alone, there were 62 tiger muskies that were caught and registered out of, out of Cedar Lake, and eight of them were over 40 inches. And not even it's not even a fishery anymore. So it's just it's just gone. It just makes me sad. So this is all we have left. We have eight left. And by the way, if you're a West Metro person, we have Lake Nokomis. That is it. All the rest of these uh, tiger fisheries are in the East Metro. So that is, that is like literally all we have left that are now stocked and managed for tiger fisheries. So uh, another, if I was gonna had time, I would do another video. I would have done what happened to Tonka, what happened to the tigers, and I would have probably got Dusty Carlson and some of the people from the Duluth Muskie Zinc chapter, and we would have done what happened to the St. Louis River. St. Louis River is another really big body of water. It's 10,000 acres, uh, 10,000 acres plus, okay? Um, but there are some unique things that make it a little bit different. Um, you know, uh, there were a lot of muskie stocked in there up until 2005, uh, but then they, they completely just stopped stocking for 10 years, just put in nothing. Um, in that same time frame, uh, in 2012, there was a huge flood, which, you know, if you're from Minnesota, you remember it. I mean, the, all the animals in the zoo got out. There was seals like in the crosswalk of a street between stoplights, I remember on the news. And it was, it was total chaos. Right. And that just, that did like really mess up that fishery. Um, I think that, I mean, I think we probably even lost some fish because, because of it, but I think there was a kind of a mass migration out to Lake Superior. Um, and there's some other kind of issues with that lake too, where, you know, I think generally the best practice for stocking is to put the native strain um, that's native to that water in. And uh, I think while the Wisconsin DNR and Minnesota DNR were both stocking the, uh, that fishery, they were not using the Great Lakes strain. They were using leech and then, you know, the, the generic inland lake Wisconsin strain. I do think that might be changing finally now, but but in the end, I mean, you you can't argue with like you, there were zero fish put in for ten years, okay, uh, from two thousand five to two thousand fifteen. So it is, I mean, there, I know there's some extenuating circumstances there with loss of habitat and um, you know the river getting all murky in the flood, but still, you don't put fish in for ten whole years. And um, based on everything that I showed you and the other ones, you, you kind of get the idea here, right? It's kind of still the same story. So, which just brings me to the bigger picture. And the reason that I wanted to tell, like do all these videos separately is because they're all, they all have their own, you know, kind of important stories and they're all puzzle pieces to a bigger puzzle, which is just like what happened to the muskies in Minnesota, like in general, like all of our muskie fisheries, because basically they've all gone downhill. Everything is, is uh, you know, pretty overrun or depleted. And, you know, you, you, you probably know where I'm going with this, but I just put the slide up. So, you know, and it was a domino effect, basically, like Lake Mille Lacs was like, you know, the, the, the big giant, right, 128,000 acre uh, fishery that we had. And, and when that place was on, it swallowed up so many boats, right, uh, of just musky fishing pressure that it made it, even if you weren't Fishing Mille Lacs, Mille Lacs was a great thing because it made the musky fishing pressure light everywhere else. And when that crashed the way that it crashed due to that stocking issue, then it put more pressure on Vermilion and Minnetonka, that it, which again, also had their stocking issues, right? So you kind of see the dominoes falling. And then as these bigger bodies of water get, you know, the, the, the population gets lower, um, the angling hours that you have to put in to try to catch one, um, you know, get, get way up there. Everyone starts leaving those bodies of water. Where am I going to go next? And it's usually the other bigger fisheries, right? But then, then it happened to Minnetonka, right? And then the St. Louis River had its thing. So like just those four bodies of water alone, that's 191,982 acres of musky water that you know, all of a sudden swallowed up like in, in an army of boats, not just from Minnesota, but from all over the place. Right. And so 
when all of a sudden there's barely anyone out fishing those fisheries anymore because of what happened to them, the, all that fishing pressure had to disperse. And so it went everywhere else. Oh, and by the way, let's not forget that we lost 15 tiger lakes in there too, which also, you know, the boats that, you know, even if it's only one or two boats to like each of those, that's another 30 boats that now have to go somewhere else. Right. And so even, even our other bodies of water, because there's some lakes like Detroit Lake, you know, it's a very densely stocked uh, musky lake. It gets 3000 muskies every other year, but like, you know, even though the stocking is good there, like it's, there's a lot of times where it's not very fun to go fishing there because like, it's just because of what we have left, like the, you have a choice between like fishing, not in a crowd where there's not very many fish or like going somewhere where the, where it's seemingly better, but then the fishing pressure is insane and it's not very fun to be there too. And so eventually everything kind of got hit, right? And it, and everything, it took its toll on everything. That's that's why we are where we're at now. Um, and I mean, I, I'm not a biologist, okay? But I mean, a lot of this is just really straightforward math. Um, and I tried to use... Um, especially in those two videos, Malax and Vermilion, you can see I really explain it step by step. All the data is there. And I promise you that these other fisheries, even though I'm doing it very quickly here, um, you know, the, the data is there. And when you go from, you know, 15 fisheries, it's not stocking anymore and they're gone. I mean, that's just, you don't need to be a biologist to know if there's no muskies left in there, we can't fish there anymore, right? Or you don't stock a fishery for 10 years um what that means so um so all this is leading me to there is a survey right now that we can take and we can give the dnr our feedback on um how we feel about where the musky fishery is at right now um and you know maybe where we want to see it go as well and also i already took the survey and i and i'm actually going to throw it up here because it's very like oddly kind of sneakily worded where I actually had three answers on my survey that I actually checked the the opposite, the complete opposite of the box that I wanted to check because of how the questions were laid out. So I, I want to share that with you. So so bear with me here. I'm going to bring this down. Uh, let's see here. There we go. So um, I got the survey up so we can look at this real quick. So I actually want to show you some, I actually, I'm on the DNR website right now looking at the survey. And sorry, by the way, there might be a little weird edit right there. I did the whole video in one take like I planned. And then when I switched to the survey, my old screen stayed up. So I, I, I was watching it through quick. So now I'm going to have, this is me kind of throwing this in after the fact. So sorry if it's a little weird there, but this is important. I want you to know this because it really threw me off. Okay. So I just jumped ahead to question six. That's where things start getting weird. Um, you know, with most surveys that I've taken in my life, uh, whether you go to the doctor, get your oil changed, whatever, after you're done, um, I feel like most surveys start with like the positive where it would be strongly agree and then somewhat agree and then neither agree, you know, then the negative ones go the other way. But this survey has them flipped around. So like be aware, right, that if you're on your computer, it's like this, but it throws you off even more if you do it on a phone because then they stack vertically the other way. But the answer that like, if you want to say strongly agree, it's like kind of instinctual to just like go down one and then click it without like reading it. Right. And um, just know that they're flip flop. So read your answers carefully. And then also, if you're doing it on a laptop, this threw me off too. Um, there's, you can see there's strongly agree and somewhat agree and then, uh, or those are disagree. But then over here, there's no strongly agree but there is but you have there's a little it's very hidden because it doesn't really do anything to you get the mouse over it and then there's a little slider bar where you can slide it over and then there's the strongly agree and all of these questions are kind of that way and by the way 
I also, I feel like, like hindsight, even I like probably didn't answer these questions like in the smartest way, because I feel like they're kind of getting at like, Hey, do you like, what's the goal here? Are you trying to catch big fish or would you rather catch numbers um, of fish? But, you know, while I think most muskie anglers want to catch big fish, it's like, when Malax and Vermilion and Minnetonka, when all those lakes were like at their peaks, like we were catching like lots of big fish and numbers of fish, right? So I think in terms of numbers, we want more. Um, and I think even in my questions, I probably didn't emphasize that enough. I was more focused on size. And the other thing where I kind of kicked myself after I hit submit was um, I just remember this bugged me on, I want to say it was Vermilion, but on one of the lakes on their management goal, it was basically the 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 management goal was to uh, produce or manage so that there were fish in excess of 50 inches for anglers to catch. OK, um, but the way it was worded, it was like you could have one 50 inch muskie in that lake. And if you're measuring the goal, it was accomplished, right, because there was a fish that was 50 inches or 50 plus inches that was in there. So you know, and if there's like barely any fish in there, that's not really, you know, I, I think we want, I think what we want is we want to be able to go out and bump into some muskies in a reasonable amount of time when we're fishing on these lakes. Right. Um, and, and we're musky anglers. We know what reasonable means. So something to think about there. Also, I uh, wanted to prep you if you haven't taken the survey yet, there's a couple different spots where they have open-ended questions. So if you have some thoughts about like either complaints or requests for like how you want our musky fisheries to be managed. Um, you might want to type them out ahead of time on your phone or on your computer so that you could just cut and paste them in there um, when you're taking the survey. Uh, also, you know, whatever. I, I, I'm sure this is going to stir the pot, but if you have feelings about uh, forward facing sonar, you might be able to sneak some comments in here too. So um, let's see here. What else did I want to mention? I feel like there is one other thing I wanted to bring up. But just keep in mind that, you know, again, like on question nine, like normally you would expect the first answer to be very satisfied, but it's very unsatisfied. So everything's flip-flopped um, in the order that it's up there. Oh, and this is another one, and it's and it's the same thing. It, it it even when I went back, I missed this one. They ask about DNR biologists uh, being able to better understand musky populations. Basically, they're asking like, how do you feel about participating using like a smartphone app to help the DNR? And and I'm not telling that's your own personal like privacy. So I'm not telling anyone you have the right to choose whatever you want there. And I'm not trying to steer you. I'm just trying to tell you, make sure you check what you want it to be, whatever it is, because I submitted this one. I I put very unwilling and I meant to, I personally meant to put very willing. Um, and, and I and I reversed it by accident and submitted it that way. So it's just, it's in there now that way. So I just wanted to point these things out to you, um, partly because I was kind of kicking myself after I took the survey. Um, here's some more of those questions where you have the slider bar um off to the side so make sure you're aware of that and again that the negative ones are offered first and i think that's that's it i'm not going to really tell you guys how to tell everyone how to answer but there's another there's another open-ended one at the end so I just wanted to, I wanted to arm you with that information too. So when you take the survey, you actually put down the answers um, or leave the open in the comments that you want to when you're prepared to do it and you don't screw it up like I did. Thanks for watching all this. And I hope you all take the survey and give the DNR the feedback that they need. Thanks again.